Jesus didn't give up. I want to welcome Bush Lake, West Tonka, again, all of us who are gathered here online and together in our space. And I want to share with you just a brief story as we begin to bring our reflection into Jesus. Jim Elliott was a gentleman whom I become familiar with um, related to his story when I was in my early 20s as a young Christ follower. And Jim Elliott um, had this passion, along with four of his good buddies when they were in their 20s, to bring the love of Jesus Christ to people who had never heard of the name of Jesus. And they were earnest in their pursuit to that given end. And they identified a group, a tribal group in Ecuador known as the Aka Indians that had no contact with the outside world. And they determined that it would be wise and good to share the love of Jesus Christ with them. Plans were made, and they courageously got on their float plane and made their way to this remote jungle, landed on the river base beside it. And as they got out of their plane, the Aka Indians came out and greeted them on the beach. And then immediately speared them each to death. And... Elizabeth Elliot, Jim's wife, was devastated, as you can imagine, and processed, what does she do with all of this? And she said something that, um, in my 20s, really grabbed me, has been a compass for my life ever since. She said, sometimes life is so hard, all you can do is the next thing. Whatever the next thing is, just do it. And you've probably been in that place in your life where it's been difficult to know if you had the strength to do the next thing. She was in that given place, but she began to pray. She began to process before the Lord and plan, if God, you would want me to go to the Aki Indians, the very ones who had killed her husband and the friends, I will go. She prayed and she planned, the door got open, and with courage, she made her way to live among the tribe for two years that would be the very same people who would have killed her husband and their friends. I think about that story, and over those two years, rather than her being speared, she shared the love of Christ, and the chief and the whole village put their faith in Christ, and they asked for forgiveness for killing her husband and those friends, and then They became proclaimers of the gospel to other remote tribes in Ecuador. And if you want to see a beautifully crafted documentary, it's called um, Splendor at the Gates by Jim Elliott. That story of Jim Elliott, you can pick up and actually take it in and look at it. Well, I, I think about how she stepped in and the only way she could have done what she did with determined love to bring the gospel to those um, Aka tribes was to have been touched by the determined love of God for her in her own life, and she was. And that's what I'd like to do this evening, speak about this love that transforms us, specifically with the question is, what gives Jesus the strength to advance and go all the way to the cross for you and for me? And I'm gonna let the scriptures pretty much tell the story to step in and see that He's anointed, that gives him um, the ability to have the strength to advance, that he is um, caught up in a way of service that is unlike anything we've ever seen, that gives him the strength to advance. He has a vision to see tomorrow, he has obedience to the Father in his will, he has an identity, he has a surety of himself, and he has a purpose for why he came. All of these things give him the strength to advance. What I wanna do is invite you to follow Jesus and to sit with him in the different spaces and the movements that take place on the way to the cross. So let's follow Jesus and sit with him first in Bethany. The strength to advance for Jesus begins with an anointing. 
In fact, it happens in Bethany. Bethany is just a village about 45 minutes uh, in terms of a walk outside of Jerusalem up to um, the town of Bethany. I've been to that town and I've done that walk and it's quite an experience to relive it. And it's here in Bethany that that they are in the home of Simon the leper. Jesus touched and healed him, all the company that Jesus keeps, but also Mary of Bethany is there, and Mary who has very little, but she has an exquisite jar of perfume, an alabaster jar which she breaks and pours on Jesus' head and washes his feet with that perfume with her hair, and it completely exasperates the friends and disciples that are there thinking, what are you doing? That could have been used for the poor. But Jesus sees it as a beautiful act And in Mark's gospel, it says, why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And so we find the determined love of Jesus is made clear that what she has done is anointed him. It was a prophetic um, fulfillment that had taken place for the, the work that was before him, that she was preparing him for death and burial. So this is a Tuesday before the Thursday. She hasn't even come to the upper room yet. He's just anticipating this is the end of the journey. And she abides in the way of the Lord and does the anointing with this oil and makes her way over to Jesus and washes his feet. It's really quite an extraordinary scene because the prophetic significance is not just the death and the burial of Jesus, it's just around the corner. It's also the confidence, determination that the gospel is gonna advance because he's not gonna stay dead so the whole world will have the gospel and people will speak about Mary in this act that she had uh, given to Jesus by washing his feet with oil. And I think about that love that is determined for you and me. It's a determined love for us to give our best to God as Mary gave her best to God. It is to be ambassadors of the gospel as Mary herself was an ambassador of the gospel. It's part of our anointing to give God the best and to proclaim the name of Jesus to the families of the earth. This is in Bethany on Tuesday, but now with resolve, resolute, he makes his way to Jerusalem. Let's follow Jesus and sit with him in Jerusalem. Well, we know it's Thursday now in Jerusalem, in the upper room, and he's with his friends. And when we turn to Mark's gospel, we find that there are some incredible words about what happens that evening in Jerusalem that would change all of history, would change you and me and the lives that we live, that Jesus has the strength to advance because of his way, his way of serving. It's unlike anybody has ever seen in all of history and it's impacted our lives in powerful ways even today. And it says in John 13, having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Or another version says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And so he shows a different kind of love. What did he do that was so different? First of all, when they came into that upper room experience to... um, enjoy the Passover feast together, he gets down on bended knee and he washes the feet of all of his disciples. The king of kings, the prince of princes, he is the one who washes the feet of the disciples. And some are offended. Peter says, you cannot wash my feet. Who are you to wash my feet? And Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you will have no part of me. Well, he wants to have all the parts of Jesus that he can. And so he does allow Jesus to wash his feet. Here, here friend, is the, the invitation for us that we must let Jesus serve us. It's only what we receive that we can then give away. And we find this incredible picture of what he does in this given place. He loves them by sacrificially getting down and washing them, their feet, showing that he came to serve, not to be served, that our lives are marked by service, but also that he loved them to the end. That is, that he would not retain in the way that he loves anything for himself, which is so different in the way that we love. In fact, we love with the sense of, um, of knowing that we'll love until there's a betrayal. That if you uh, betray me in any kind of way, then I'll have nothing to do with you. But Jesus will go all the way to the cross, even in the midst of that kind of betrayal. Or forsakenness. 
we love until we're forsaken. Any kind of forsakenness in our relationships, we go, I want nothing to do with you, but Jesus, he, he walks through even forsakenness to the cross. We love with limits and all kinds of conditions. He loves us to the end. So much so that he teaches a whole new way of life for each of us. He continues on this way. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so. That is what I am. And now I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. And once you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. It's in that upper room, he sets out this new command for us to love one another as he loves us, to wash feet as he washes feet. He calls us to be foot washers in this given place. That's what happens in John 13. We're reminded of his determined love that will allow him to have the strength to advance as he washes feet. It's a way of serving the world that goes beyond self. And we have this determined love lived out in us to do the same to let his example be ours, to love in new ways. And that's what Monday, Thursday means, a new commandment. Love each other as I have first loved you. In that upper room experience, the world would change and he would have the strength to advance simply by the way of his active servitude to others. And so we follow Jesus from Jerusalem to his next place as he makes a journey about another 50 minutes away to the Mount of Olives. Let's sit with him in the Mount. The Mount of Olives is a, a mountain ridge that is really adjacent to Jerusalem. In fact, um, we find that it's a mountain ridge that many people would go to, Jesus himself in his life and his journey in powerful ways. And on that mount, something happens. It's here that we have the story of his encounter with Peter. And he tells Peter at the Mount of Olives that you will betray me three times. And Peter says, I will not fall away from you. I will not disown you. He says, even if I have to die, I will be with you. I will not fall away. And Jesus, we find, shows his vision that the strength to advance comes out of his ability to see all that is ahead. And he shares these words, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. He doesn't go into any defensiveness related to where Peter is. He just says, it's gonna happen. And after it happens, and the day will come, after I've risen, he is determined to communicate. He's just not gonna die and be buried. He's gonna rise again. I will come to you in Galilee. I'm gonna die, I'm gonna be buried, and I'm going to Galilee to see you. And so that love determined by Jesus is also a love that is determined in and through us as well because we're identifying with Peter. He's bringing this story to help us understand who we are, that we're the same as Peter. We struggle. We want to follow Jesus with our everything, but our want to doesn't always connect with our will to, and our will to follow through falls short. In other words, Peter messes up, and so do we. And Jesus gives this beautiful promise there on the Mount of Olives with determination that I will rise and I'll be with you. Even when you fall away, don't run away. Run toward me. I am here for you. That's love that's determined by Jesus for us. And we live with that hope here in the Mount of Olives. But now we follow Jesus down the hill to this beautiful garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane, this is a beautiful garden. I've been to it a number of times. You can visit it today. It's a place Jesus visits throughout the Gospels. In fact, uh, we find that he not only visits sometimes by himself, but oftentimes with others. It's a place where he's renewed. It's where he's rested. It's the place where something amazing happens. In this given scene, we see the strength of Jesus to advance because of his obedience. They went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John along with him and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow even to the point of death. Have you ever been so overwhelmed in your life that you just want to die? 
Some of you may have been in such a place, maybe in that place today, you're not alone. Jesus was in this place. And we fact, we, we take a look and we see that the, that the full agony of Jesus is starting to unfold. We feel the vulnerability. Is he really determined to go all the distance for us because it seems like he's vulnerable in this given place? It's as though the agony sweeps through the garden like a tornado, it turns up his body to the end that his body is about to pass out. And so we find that it continues. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if it is possible that this hour might pass, Abba, Father, he prays, Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And so we find this picture of of Jesus um, in the presence of the Father, who I think is showing him the cup of bitterness that he's about to drink, and he looks deep within, and his body churns with what he sees, and it's almost as if he's ready to vomit. I can't go through. Is there anything you can do? You can do everything. Is there any way this cup could be taken from me? Not my will, but your will be done. Oh, he wants to be obedient. But understand that Jesus had always wanted to do the Father's will. But he always experienced the love of the Father, the favor of the Father in doing his will. In this given moment, he's looking into the depth of the cup and what is the agony that he sees? Our first response is the unspeakable suffering that will be his on the cross. But I just want to make it clear to you that Jesus ultimately does not die because of um, the oxygen that has washed away from his lungs. It's not a physical death that is first the depth of his agony that makes him say, is there another way? It's a relational one that comes to him. It is this picture that it is the removal, the withdrawal of the love of God in his heart, not the oxygen in his lungs, but the love of God in his heart because that's all he had ever known. And so we find Here in this garden of Gethsemane, the determined love of the Lord, what a determined love it is to walk through, even though um, he will have a moment of hell. That is, he will not experience the presence of the Lord's love. There will be an abandonment, a separation, and it almost undoes him, but he trusts. And that is our call. That love of Jesus determined for us, lived out in us, is to trust no matter what it is we come against when we feel like Jesus is, or the Father is not present, we can still go through and be with him. And then we leave this beautiful garden and make our way back up to Jerusalem, about a half an hour's walk from the garden, and there we find Jesus. And he was with the high priest at the court of Sanhedrin, and he will be with Pilate as well. So let us follow Jesus and sit with him at the court of the spiritual leaders. It just seems unthinkable to me that spiritual leaders would come against Jesus the way they do, including the high priest. In fact, we find that the high priest has words to share with Jesus that is really difficult to take in with the questions that he asks, how they're setting up Jesus for his own death. And these are the words the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to the death. But they did not find any. And then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is the testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent, and he gave no answer. And again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? I am, Jesus said. Well, the strength to advance is found in his identity. He knows who he am, who he is, and he's, he makes it clear to everyone. He doesn't get defensive about the false accusations against him. He says nothing about it but he speaks the truth concerning his identity and he's comfortable with who he is and this is what unfolds. They all condemned him as worthy of death and then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him. They struck him with their fists and said, prophesy, and the guards took him and they beat him. And it's during this scene that that we find Peter again is watching from a distance and then flees and hides and denies three times after being asked, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. And he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know this man that you're talking about. 
And so you find Peter doing the very thing that Jesus said he would do, that he himself did not believe he would do. And it begs the question, do people know that you are a Jesus person? He couldn't own it in that given moment. But the determined love of God lived out in us is to be unashamed, to say, I am a Jesus person. And Peter falls short. He knows we fall short at times, but reminds us to come back as we'll see on that resurrection Sunday that Peter does indeed come back. And then he comes before Pilate, the governor of Judea, who asks four questions, two of Jesus, two of the crowd, and we read, they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate. That's question one. Jesus answers, yes. It is as you say. Question two, the chief priest accused him of many things. So again, he asked him, aren't you going to give an answer? See how many things they're accusing you of. And Jesus gives no reply. And Pilate's amazed. This is about your life. And he's amazed. The determined nature of Jesus to express his identity but not defend himself in false accusations. And then he says to the crowd, do you want me to release you to the king of the Jews, asked Pilate, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to them? But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. Question number four, what shall I do then with the one that you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them, crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And then he had Jesus turned over and flogged. Different than whipping, flogging includes little um, stone glass shards that are put on the end of the leper, to the leather to, to rip open the skin. And he handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into that palace, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. And they put a purple robe on him and wove a crown of thorns on his head. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews, again and again. They struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him, falling on their knees. They worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put on his own clothes and they let him off to be crucified. It's just unspeakable the awful things that happened to him, the terrible words that are spoken, the horrible sounds that he makes as he suffers on the way to the cross. And that's where we go, to Golgotha, the last destination. And he has the strength to advance because he's clear about his purpose. His purpose is to glorify God for the sake of all humanity in the name of God who meets us. They crucify him. It was the third hour when they crucified him with written notice of charges against him, read the king of the Jews, and they crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by hurled insults going on, and they're saying, so you are the the one that's gonna destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? Come down from the cross and save yourself. And in the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him. He saved others. Why can't he save himself? Let this Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe him. And those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. And at the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Wow. It is the song of heaven, the lamb. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. And instead of being forgotten because of what Jesus did did for us, we are now seen. Instead of living a life filled with shame, we find guilt is lifted up. Instead of being a people who are broken, we are now made whole. That instead of being empty and feeling empty in our lives, we are filled up with love. Instead of facing death, we will be alive because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. What a gift. So we come back to those incredible words that just so casually flow from our lips. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe on him would not perish but have everlasting life. Oh yeah, let's 
love the love. Let's love the everlasting life. But let us remember that love comes with a cost, which is why on that Thursday evening, they gathered together and came to the table and Jesus instituted what we now call the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. When we receive the bread, um, being reminded of his coming into our world, we receive the cup, being reminded of his blood shed for your sin and my sin. But the point of it is, we read of the story of his death and his crucifixion then, and we sometimes think it's about others and what they did to him. On this Monday, Thursday, as is our tradition, we come to remember that my sin did it. Three times, say it with me. My sin did it, again. My sin did it, with humility but conviction. My sin did it, it did. And he put upon himself the sin of the world, your sin and my sin, in order to set us free. So we come to this table remembering, because he told us never forget, that he came and that he died for us. So join me and let's pray together and give thanks to the Lord for this beautiful gift of his life offered on our behalf. So Father, we come humbly grateful for the determined love of Jesus that would go the distance and not give up the determination that says, I am here all the way because of a love from heaven revealed to us on earth in Jesus Christ so that our love would be renewed and reconciled with the love of God. Father, there might be some here, even in this gathering, who are distant from you, who have not yet believed. And I pray before the bread comes to their lips or the cup comes to their lips by the power of the Holy Spirit, you draw them into salvation, into life because of who you are and what you've done on our behalf. And we will give you praise, honor, and glory this day and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen.